Good morning, all. Uh, welcome to our panel on decarbonization. I'm pleased to, uh, to moderate this panel this morning, uh, and I appreciate uh, all the work that Capital Link has done in setting up this initiative. We have a terrific group of panelists with us today. Uh, you'll see on your screens, uh, we have Hamish Norton, who is the president of Starbolt Carriers. We have John uh, Butler, the president and CEO of the World Shipping Com Council. There is Carrie Troth, the general manager, shipping in Maritime Americas of Shell Trading and Supply. Next is Jeffrey Prebor, who is the CFO of International Seaways. We next have John, uh, excuse me, Frederick Kenny, who is the Director of Legal Affairs and External uh, Relations Division of the IMO. And last but not least, we have Mark O'Neill, who is the CEO of Columbia Ship Management. Hello. Now, this, uh, this distinguished panel is prepared to address uh, a number of the key issues that the industry is seeing with respect to decarbonization strategies, options, and initiatives. And we're going to try to walk through some of those with you today and at least scratch the surface in the next 40 or 45 minutes or so. So uh, let me start off uh, by, by just pointing out that there have been, uh, and I, sh I guess I should introduce myself, I'm John Keogh. <laughs> I'm a partner at Clyde & Co. here in New York. I co-head the firm's North American practice on uh, international trading and shipping. Now, I, I, I wanted to just point out there have been a number of initiatives in the industry, the IMO uh, uh, spearheading one in particular, focusing on decarbonization. Um, everyone is well familiar with the IMO 2020 uh, work that they've been doing and that the industry has been engaged in and, uh, and the next steps ahead have been uh, pro the, uh, the result of a good deal of work that the industry, including John Butler's team at the World Council, have been doing. And I know International Seaways is at the forefront as well of, uh, of that work. So let me just say in the uncertainty and the economic challenges that we're all facing these days uh, as we work from home um, with the COVID 19 pandemic. Uh, what to each of, let me ask Hamish first, what do you see as, as the next important step for shipping in prioritizing how to achieve decarbonization in the industry? Well, you know, I, I, I think the next thing that the shipping industry needs to do is figure out to the extent possible, what is the end game? Because there are a lot of intermediate steps that we already really know about. Um, you know, LNG is one of them, um, you know, uh, hull fouling reduction, um, flattener rotors or other wind power, uh, you know, air bubblers. These are all more or less known, but what is not known is, what is the final solution? What's the zero carbon solution that we need to work toward? And, um, you know, I think until we know that, uh, there's gonna be tremendous uncertainty in the shipping industry. And, and frankly, I think uh, it's gonna be very difficult for ship owners to order ships. Before, uh, before we take that a step further, let me just mention also that for our viewers, uh, there will be a chat box that appears at the bottom of your screen. And so we'd ask that you please enter your questions in that chat box as you go along. And we'll have an opportunity at the end of the panel session to answer those questions. Thanks. Thanks. So, uh, Jeff, could you comment, please, on what you see from your perspective at International Seaways as that next most important step in prioritizing decarbonization? Well, I think we see that it touches on several aspects of running a shipping company. On the, on the technical operations side, uh, as Hamish mentioned, we're, 
we're taking the steps that we can see already in front of us, like, you know, software that we've invested in for more efficient operations, or we're looking at new coatings, you know, we'll consider things for existing vessels, like even retrofitting for sales, if that makes sense to get some level of efficiency. I think all ship owners will look at those type of, of solutions for an existing, our existing fleet, but it won't get us there. It, it'll be a progress, but it won't get us far enough along the way to even the 50% reduction, let alone zero carbon. So really, I think I agree with Hamish that it's going to be, will be really important to determine what's the next, what's the right technology so that we can invest our capital uh, in, in new vessels without fear of it being stranded capital uh, and, and, and in ships that will get us a, along the curve to where we want to be. And that's not, not that answer is not clear yet. Let me turn to, to John Butler at the World Shipping Council. John, could you tell us where does the industry stand now in terms of decarbonization? Is there a dedicated research and development uh, effort being made? And could you describe briefly where, where you see the industry on that? Sure. And I think Jeff and Hamish both touched on the critical point, which is the industry is doing a lot of things, both in terms of technical work, in terms of operational work to reduce emissions. And there have been some pretty significant um, advances made in the last 10 years. But the fact of the matter is, so long as we're essentially a fossil fuel based industry, we're not going to meet the 2050 goals that the International Maritime Organization has set. And we're not going to meet the goal um, beyond 2050, which is decarbonization uh, as soon as possible after 2050. And with that in mind, um, you made reference um, to something that, that we, and not just as the World Shipping Council, but uh, eight um, trade associations with consultative status at the IMO back in December uh, submitted a fairly detailed proposal in which we propose uh, under the auspices of the IMO to set up a research and development facility that would be essentially funded by industry um, to answer precisely the question that Hamish asked, which is, what's the end game? At the end of the day, as we move away from fossil fuels, what do we move to? Because at this point, there are a number of promising alternative fuels that would actually take us to zero carbon ships there are things like green ammonia, uh, green hydrogen. Uh, there are other possibilities out there. The problem that we have right now is that we don't know which of those technologies in the end will actually be feasible, especially for large transoceanic vessels. There are all sorts of questions and problems of energy density, engineering to deal with storage and, and safe use of those fuels on vessels. And we're talking about, if we're going to reach our 2050 goal, we really have to start putting zero carbon vessels on the water in the early 2030s. That's just around the corner. And so we see a critical need to ramp up the research and development effort so that we can get over the hump of figuring out what are the fuels of the future that are most likely to end up being feasible and focus our future work on doing the engineering necessary to actually put those on vessels in a safe way. Fred Kenny, perhaps let's stick with the regulatory framework here for just a moment. Could you, could you explain, Fred, where things stand at the IMO on this, on this initiative and, and how does the COVID-19 uh, pandemic uh, disruption affect the IMO's scheduling? Well, thanks, John, and uh, thanks for having me here. Um, as many of you know, this week we should have been having the Intercessional Working, House, uh, working Group on Greenhouse Gas Emissions, and next week we were going to be holding the MEPC meeting at which the, uh, the Research and Development Fund uh, that John Butler was just discussing would have had its first reading and, and first uh, in-depth discussion on where we might go with that. Uh, of course, uh, we've postponed all meetings up to the end of May. Um, and we 
have not yet made a decision on what, uh, whether we'll be holding any meetings in June uh, or July as yet. Uh, we're, the Secretary General is very closely monitoring the situation and, uh, and uh, we're gonna look not only at what other UN agencies are doing and not just at the guidance that we're getting at the UK government, from the UK government, but another important factor is with 174 member states coming from all around the world, we have to monitor the situation everywhere to see if delegates can actually get to London. Different countries are on different timelines with this pandemic, unfortunately. So uh, right now, uh, we're just monitoring to see when we can reconstruct the schedule. We have been in close contact with the chairs of all of the IMO organs, all the committees and the council. Uh, and the vice chairs as well, to get their input regarding reconstruction, particularly with respect to priorities. And it's pretty clear that the, one of the, the key priorities is going to be getting the, the Greenhouse Gas Intercessional Working Group uh, held and MEPC as soon as we possibly can. Thanks, Fred. Thanks. Mark O'Neill, as a ship manager, what do you see as the next steps that the industry needs to be taking? I, I'm, uh, I, I've got to say, first of all, thank you for having me on the panel. Uh, I've got to say that um, I think the, the effect of COVID-19 pandemic is, is being remarkably underplayed. Uh, and I say that with respect by the other speakers, it may well be because many of those speakers are US based and, and it is yet to uh, fall with the full uh, force on, on, on the US shores as it has done in Europe and, and, and to the East. I don't think that shipping is in any place yet to decide on decarbonization a decarbonization timetable and alternative fuels until we see what the landscape looks like and the appetite looks like uh, post this pandemic and and I think the the timing of this pandemic is being woefully underplayed as well you know we are not going to be through this in any time soon and uh, on the one side we have the positives from uh, COVID-19 the very few positives which is if you talk to the next generation or our kids' generation, a, a, a greater focus on oneself, on humanitarian issues, on freedom issues, uh, on the environment. So I think COVID-19 will feed that, will, will feed this environmental green um, uh, movement even more. The, the, the Greta Thunberg movement will, I, I think, take great strength from this COVID-19 because people have had a lot of time to reflect on what matters to them and environment matters. There's no doubt about that. Uh, so you, on, on the one side, you have, you have this COVID, the positive from COVID-19, and I say that with, with, with reservation, feeding this environmental, uh, perhaps, uh, what matters uh, lobby. You've also got a wonderful opportunity on, on governments to tear up the old. And if you look at some of the, the greatest achievements in the last hundred years, they occurred after uh, massive historical events, last being uh, the Second World War. After the Second World War, you know, my own country brought in the National Health Service, brought in a lot of the institutions, which just wouldn't have been possible without the disruption that uh, a war or a pandemic like this Bring. So maybe, too, you see uh, government saying, you know, to hell with uh, 2050 as being the time, uh, the, the, the time limit. Let's bring this forward. We've got a wonderful opportunity now uh, to bring this forward. Against both of those, you've got realism. You know, economies are going to be broken or quasi broken at, at the end of this uh, pandemic. And the, the economic reality is someone's got to pay for this. And is that a time when uh, governments want to really be considering green issues which cost money, decarbonisation, and will they be pushing those sort of issues into the long grass? Will they be saying, look, we've taken some steps, let's live with those steps, but let's get business back working um, in, a, uh, in a familiar format? I just don't know, but I think, uh, you know, to say uh, we are happily, after this pandemic, whenever that might be, we will happily trot along with any previous plan is woefully underplaying the significance of uh, COVID-19, both in the, in the first wave 
and what we understand there will be three waves. So uh, the landscape will change radically. And I don't think, I think shipping will inevitably be flexible and go along with this, but you, to plan now in, in this context is, is, would be premature, I think. Carrie, you've been patient there waiting. Uh, thank you, thank you for your patience. Where do you see, from, uh, from the Shell perspective, uh, where do you see the initiative uh, coming from in the in the shipping industry for decarbonization? And what's what's Shell's perspective? Do they see a collaboration with uh, vessel owners and operators? Uh, what's yeah, your really fair question, John. So thank you for asking. Um, the advantage of going, I think, last is I get the opportunity of hearing everyone else and. Mark, we can't, uh, we can't move forward without acknowledging what you've just talked about, that the market, that the global trade patterns are going to change over the next three, six, nine months. And so maybe our first most important thing is just to keep the shipping moving, keep the global trade lines open as best we can, goods flowing as best as possible. When we think about decarbonization, I might disagree with Jeff and Hamish up front that there are actually near-term levers today that if we pull them together, we can get to the 2030 ambitions of IMO. So if you talk about alternate fuels that are available now, natural gas, if you talk about technologies that you can install on board, whether that's sails, uh, turbines, air carpets, air lubrication systems, or even simple hull design issues, hull design propellers, engine choices, a number of these things together, we're seeing in our own fleet making 2030 size moves in our greenhouse gas. But talking about what we do as an industry together, and I think most people have heard about the Getting to Zero Coalition, which is part of the Global Maritime Forum. Shell was one of the first companies to sign up to that. And that is industry coming together, trying to define what those longer term paths are while we have the near term levers, also looking at the longer term to design. And the ambition is to float that first zero carbon ship by 2030. Jeff. International Seaways has uh, has taken some initiatives in this respect. What do you see as the broad challenges or, or the impacts on global greening and shipping? And maybe you could tell us a little bit about uh, your perspective on the Poseidon principles and financing of vessels in this context, and, and perhaps respond to Carrie to the extent you'd like. Well, sure. Um, first of all, uh, Carrie, I, th I think we're in sync uh, in, in that I mentioned, and I'll happily re-mention that we, and I'm sure it's true of Hamish's company as well, will take all those, we'll pull all those levers mm -hmm. that are available on our existing fleet. And I hope they get us close to the 2030 uh, targets for mm -hmm. sure. And um, uh, the question I, I think for the longer term is when can we invest in a vessel, the kind of vessel that we've heard described so far today, that will be available, or as you just was described, mm -hmm. available by 2030 to go on the water, be part of our fleet, be our fleet, and, and take us through to 2050 and, and the zero carbon beyond. And, and so that, that's, I guess there's two aspects of the technological mm -hmm. question, what to do in the next 10 years. And I agree, we'll pull all the levers we can. And then what's the longer term solution that Hamish brought up at the beginning of the panel? But since you've asked me, John, about the other aspect of it, uh, in, as a CFO, where, where do I see things in finance? Um, the, our capital providers, whether it's debt or equity, uh, care very much about decarbonization and about ESG broadly, obviously, decarbonization is in the E. Uh, Poseidon Principles is a good example of it. Uh, the, the banks got together and put forward a protocol where the, all the banks that, that are lending to companies like ourselves, uh, that the banks that are in Poseidon Principles, and it's a growing group, uh, ask us to, we covenant to uh, disclose uh, the uh, CO2 emissions in the same way they were telling the, uh, the IMO. There's no more teeth to it than, than that initially, but it's a framework that allows companies to take, companies and banks to take the next step as, for example, we did with our a bank group in January put in a, a new loan that has a feature in it where the interest rate or the margin will move up or down a little bit depending upon whether we are meeting the trajectories of our fleet towards the 2030 uh, and, and ultimately 2050 goals. So that's the kind of thing that the Poseidon principle can be used as a framework to build upon. 
for capital providers and companies to 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 take concrete steps. So I think that's that's a beginning. I think we'll see a lot more of that from the banks who are involved with Poseidon principles, and we'll see equity providers uh, uh, more willing to provide equity to ESG sensitive and decarbonizing companies, and or put the, the other way, less willing to invest in companies that aren't taking those those steps. So I think it's. Uh, I think the financial community will provide a lot of discipline a, a, as well as motivation here. Hamish, do you have a perspective on that and, and the, you know, in terms of the obligations of, of uh, vessel owners to march towards decarbonization as quickly as possible? Do uh, you have any comments in reply to what Jeff and Carrie have commented on? Yeah. No, no, absolutely. Um, you know, I, I think first of all, um, in complete agreement with Carrie and Jeff, that we have to take um, the small steps, which in combination can result in a pretty substantial reduction in emissions. I, I think probably the the lowest hanging fruit, particularly in dry bulk and to some extent in tankers, is hull fouling because dry bulk ships and to a lesser extent tankers go slowly and have trouble washing off the hull fouling. And, you know, th there are new technologies that are coming on board that can limit hull fouling and, and uh, you know, a, hull, a fouled ship can burn easily 20%, 30% more fuel than a clean hull. Uh, in dry bulk, and uh, you know that should be the first thing we we deal with. And then there are other uh, ways of reducing hull friction. You know, bubblers. Uh, there are ways of increasing propeller efficiency. Um, you know, there are. Uh, you know, but th this is with existing ships, and I think that's crucial because. The fact is that in the old days, and I, I think the old days ended a few years ago, uh, ship owners could be reasonably confident that if they built a ship that was legal at the time they built it, that it would be grandfathered in to the rules framework for its entire you know, economic useful life. And I think right now the political environment is such that ship owners are very concerned that a ship they get built today that is legal today will not be grandfathered in for its entire remaining economic useful life and that that ship may be obsolete and they may be forced to scrap it uh, in some very environmentally sensitive yard that may they may have to pay to to uh, to scrap at um, you know in five or ten years and so I'm terrified about the prospect of ordering ships and all the ship owners I know are terrified. Um, and you know, that, that's, that's actually good for the shipping industry. It maybe isn't the ideal situation for the environment. Um, Fred, is there a mandate on new shipbuildings uh, moving towards zero carbon ships? Where do you, where do you see that going in? And and I suppose along those same lines, perhaps you could comment on on amending MARPOL Annex Six, and and can those processes be accelerated? Well, I, I mean, I think I think all of the uh, I think all of the speakers have mentioned you know the initial strategy for the reduction of greenhouse uh, gas emissions from ships, which was adopted by the MEPC and. 2018, uh, and of course, work continues to uh, adopt the final strategy by 2023, and you know, a significant amount of, of work is going to need to be done by the member states to, to get to 2023 and develop the, um, the implementing mechanisms to meet the strategy. Um, now, that is going to uh, necessarily entail some amendments to MARPOL, uh, whatever they may be. Some may be extensive, others may be uh, less so in nature. Uh, it, the, the fastest that MARPOL can be amended under the convention, if everything goes perfectly and there's no debate on an issue, is, is 22 months. 
that actually, in order to, to do it at 22 months, that, that involves uh, eliminating a step that's not required that the committee almost always takes, and that's called the approval step, which is uh, an internal mechanism of the MEPC and the other committees to, to solidify consensus. Um, so, uh, and you really can't go any faster than 22 months. Uh, now, um, with respect to Hamish's last comment, you know, there is, there actually is a, a grandfathering clause in MARPOL. Uh, and that would have to be, I think, considered before uh, a, a sh ships would not be grandfathered out. And it's, it's never happened that uh, in the history of the organization where a piece of equipment or a certain technology has been banned outright. And then um, uh, someone earlier was talking about stranded capital where, where the IMO has stranded capital. John Butler, is it, is this a, an initiative that needs to be legally mandated? Can ship owners just voluntarily agree in, in, the, in the initiative that you've been working on or does it require a legal mandate? How do you see the industry coalescing on this? Well, it clearly requires an industry, a, a legal mandate. And that's why we've come as an industry as a whole to the IMO. Um, there are a couple of reasons why that's the case. I mean, everyone who's been in this industry for any length of time knows that it's a tremendously varied industry. Uh, it's not one industry, it's many, many industries. And you've got big players and small players. And the idea that you could do something across the industry without some sort of legal mandate, uh, central point of contact, it, it's just not realistic. So that's why we brought our proposal um, for a new research and development uh, facility to the IMO. Um, Fred was just making reference to the potential uh, legal instruments that could be used. The IMO is the only body on the face of the planet that is in a position to do this on a, on a global basis. In addition, of course, we've already got at the IMO a fuel burn reporting system. And so in order to um, implement the, um, the fee collection part of this proposal, the funding mechanism, we already have a structure in place where we know what people are, are burning every year and that ties into to the contribution that they would make. So it absolutely has to be mandatory. Thank you, John. Carrie, is, is LNG the elephant in the room here? Where is where, where do you see the role for LNG or other alternative fuels from the Shell perspective? Yeah, no, great question. Um, certainly LNG is part of the mix and LNG is part of the mix for the, for the foreseeable future. Today, it's the only low carbon or low greenhouse gas uh, fuel that's available in the whole fuel mix. So we're seeing particularly the vessels who have more of a liner trade. So you're container vessels, your tankers, your cruise ships, um, able to transition to LNG as the LNG network builds out around the country or around the globe. The reality is that LNG, like I said earlier, gets us part of the way there and then you need additional technologies if LNG remains in the mix in the long term, which Shell thinks it will, whether that's one that wasn't mentioned was carbon capture. You might indeed combine LNG with small scale on the vessel carbon capture and start to see even closer to that zero carbon. Um, the other things that we really haven't talked about yet are digitalization. So what are the digital optimization tools that can be used, whether that's on routing and steaming speeds or whether that's in individual ports. And I don't come with a recommended shell solution to that, except that we see across the whole portfolio different digital tools being implemented. So when you think then about digital tools, about some of the small scale carbon capture research that we're seeing in industry, as well as natural gas, you see that as a big part of the solution into the future. What kind of um, digital, those, tool would you, what kind of digital ah, tool would you? Port optimization tools, turnaround tools, efficiency tools for traffic routing. Um, we can talk about the Port of Rotterdam where Shell's been involved in a, in a software program to do efficiency, to minimize the turnaround time, the waiting time across the entire port um, and seeing 
advances there, but there are also other companies who are moving forward in port turnaround time softwares. Mark, operationally, where do you see LNG and other fuels in, the, in this move to decarbonize? I, I just want to take up uh, a good point there made, made by uh, Carrie uh, on the optimization. I mean, I, I fully agree that LNG is part of uh, the overall mix. It's, it's not the solution. And I think uh, um, what governments and international bodies have to do is look at this in a joined up way. I mean, what we have to look at is the overall emission bill in producing uh, or utilizing a particular fuel type. It's no point talking about LNG if, if, if in a certain respects it's more environmentally friendly, but it still gives out uh, uh, carbon dioxide uh, that uh, it, from an emission, from an environmental uh, perspective is perhaps equally, equally unfriendly. We have uh, at Columbia, not blowing our own trumpet, I'm sure there are others as well, but I think we do have a, a fairly unique market leading performance optimization control room and we took the, uh, the step about a year and a half ago to invest heavily in this uh, uh, the, the, both the, the, the hardware and the software and this looks at uh, we've looked at a, num a number of we participated with a number of uh, operated with a number of the, the all majors including uh, including carries on this uh, looking at all types of optimization so from uh, uh, fuel utilization to uh, consumption of, of those fuels to the use of equipment on board and it is amazing what one can do how one can optimize just through using this digital technology um, and maybe and sometimes these small steps together um, eat the elephant if you if, if you know you don't eat an elephant in in, in one bite you you eat it by a, a thousand bites and, and that's that's, I think, what we have to look at this when we're looking at the environmental question, we're looking at uh, decarbonization and uh, environmental solutions. We have to look at how we can optimize in, in various other ways. Just taking up to uh, very, 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 very quickly. Again, I come back to my opening point about post COVID and what are the, uh, what are the, the consequences? Do we really think honestly, anyone on this panel, that uh, the latest low sulfur fuel regulations would have come in post COVID. Do we think that the president of the USA would have allowed this uh, a low sulfur to come in? No, is the answer. So let's be quite realistic. When we emerge on the other side of this and try and rebuild our shattered e economies, do we, do we see President Trump leading the charge on decarbonization uh, as a means of getting the American economy back steaming. I just don't see it. And, uh, uh, you know, I think uh, these environmental issues will take a back seat, probably, arguably, a necessary back seat, whilst we re reconstruct and regroup and, uh, uh, and, and uh, uh, take our businesses further forward. So optimization, great, uh, baby steps, but I think we have to have a, a, a dose of realism as to where we will find ourselves in hopefully a few months' time. Jeff, would you like to comment with a dose of realism here on on on? Well, uh... Sure. First, first of all, I want to get on the record and thank Fred for offering to underwrite our next billion dollar fleet renewal and uh, growth program for transitional LNG fuel, perhaps. Right. So, uh, I, I hope you'll extend the the, the guarantee to Starbucks as well, since we're both on the panel. I, I think we're lining up for that, but. Uh, so thanks, Fred. But no, all, 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 all joking aside, uh, uh, first of all, on Mark's last comments, yeah, and, and, and to Carrie's about digitalization and all those steps, which sound like they're more on the tech side, it's sort of broadly technology helping the commercial side. There's a commercial aspect to levers we can pull between now and 2030, like slow steaming, but slow steaming requires port optimization because you're going to change the patterns, et cetera. So it's all part of the, the tableau. Um, I think the thing that I wanted to say is that listening to everyone, uh, I, I, I think a theme is that no one of us, and we all represent different parts of the industry, right? So ship owners, customers, regulators, uh, managers, et cetera. Uh, we, there's going to be partnerships that are required, partnerships between ourselves, partnerships with the regulators, partnerships with governments, you know, a, 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 so a way forward certainly to looking at the possibility of investing capital you're asking Hamish and me, how will we invest our capital? Do we have a responsibility to do it or not do it a certain way? A, a way forward has got to be partnering with 
with key stakeholders, other parts of, of the supply chain. Our customers like Shell, but, but uh, it, for Hamish, it should be different customers. It could be providers of LNG fuel that not as a customer so much, but as a vendor. So all kinds of partnerships need to be considered here to, so that the burden isn't falling on any, any one uh, participant in, in the chain. That, that, that's the way forward, I think. Hamish, do you want to comment on that and, and on the technological options you see as realistic? Oh, I think we lost we lost your audio, Hamish. That was my own fault for having muted it. Uh, so what I was saying is before I comment on the technological options, um, let me just point out that the oil price has collapsed um, because of reduced demand due to COVID-19 and because of increased production from uh, Saudi Arabia and Russia. And you know the, the oil analysts I read are expecting low oil prices for a long time. And um, low oil prices are not what you want um, for decarbonization. They may in fact be just what you want for rebuilding the world's economy. Um, you know, so uh, <laughs> Uh, it, it, it gives with one hand, it takes with the other, but, um, you know, at the end of the day, the shipping industry is going to decarbonize because that is in the shipping industry's commercial interest. Um, nobody is going to voluntarily reduce their profitability in order to emit less carbon dioxide. Uh, and it is the job of the regulators of the world to make sure that it is profitable for shipping companies to reduce their carbon emissions. And Does so- the ship owner have an obligation to allocate assets toward decarbonizing goal, to meeting decarbonization goals for a share? I am, I am thrilled to participate with the entire rest of the shipping industry on a level playing field basis to contribute toward research on decarbonization. But, you know, I, I, I think that it's important to understand that shipping companies are not charitable institutions and cannot be. Um, you know, they, they have to be looking out for their profitability. Um, and, you know, as part of looking out for our profitability, we are analyzing how to optimize the performance of our fleet, how to, you know, minimize the impact of hull fouling, how to take into account the uh, speed consumption curves of each of our ships in different weather conditions to optimize our routes, our speeds, you know, which has the effect of minimizing CO2 emissions. And, uh, you know, the, the technologies um, that are important for dry bulk anyway are, you know, obviously hull fouling, um, propeller efficiency optimization, um, measurements of the uh, performance of the ship at different speeds in different weather conditions so that one can optimize uh, and, you know, in, in terms of future technologies, there are, you know, hull bubblers that seem to be able to reduce hull friction. Um, there are various ways of taking advantage of wind power, um, you know, either... I'm sorry, let me, let me interrupt you right there, please. Let's, uh, we're just about out of time, uh, I'm told. Can we, let's do one quick round of everybody, just a... Uh, a burst of your last thought, uh, a lightning round here. Five words each on last comments, please. Go ahead, Hamish, since I just interrupted you. Um, the, the, the world has to make it profitable for the shipping industry to decarbonize. Great, John Butler. We know we have to decarbonize. We don't yet know how to get there. And so we have to take steps to answer that question. How do we get from where we are today to where we know we have to go? Carrie. Yeah, I think we only solve decarbonization together. Great, Jeff? Yes, partnership on the, the whole chain from, from well to wake is the way forward. Mark? 
decarbonization, it won't be driven by ship operators or the shipping industry. It'd be driven by voters, voters being stockholders or voters for, for governments. And, and, and if they are for decarbonization, they will drive the companies uh, to decarbonize nothing else. Great. Fred, wrap us up, please. Well, I think the, the consistent theme and the closing thought uh, thoughts of all speakers was partnerships, and IMO is the place where those partnerships are forged, and we look forward to serving you in that regard. Terrific. Well, thank you very much to our panelists. Again, we look forward to the questions that you can enter in your chat box, and thank you again to Capital Link for organizing this terrific initiative. Thanks to all. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.